You're listening to season one of Ding Dong Darkness Time. If this is your first time joining us, we hope you'll check out all the other episodes of this season, each one delving into the dark side of the arts. If you love it, tell the world. In the meantime, let's take a little trip, shall we? Welcome, 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 everybody. The doorbell has rung and you are now stepping inside to Ding Dong Darkness Time. I am Allison Dixon. I'm here with my buddy Chris Armstrong and uh, we're trying to figure out how to really begin the first episode of a podcast. It's very exciting, Allison. You're venturing off into this new direction that is Ding Dong Darkness Times. Very excited for it. Ever since you pitched this idea, I've been all on board. Uh, well, honestly, to be fair, I think it started with you sort of pitching me. I got to be fair about this because <laughs> you came to me about a year ago today. Uh, what, gosh, what day is this? Uh, I feel like Lebowski. Oh, uh, uh, what day is this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we'll just say that it was about a year ago ish when Chris approached me about an idea that he was having about doing uh these sort of haunting dark topics that Oh yeah. yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. And at that point, I was so deep into, well, we both w- were, we didn't realize it because we didn't talk for a bit, but when That's we true. were talking, we realized we were both listening to a ton of true crime and then it just sort of opened everything up, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like we, uh, we had been binging various true crime things. I was, uh, doing uh oh gosh well it was mainly last podcast on the left is probably one of my big standbys but then chris told me about the prosecutors after we had watched the reboot of unsolved mysteries oh the case of ray rivera mystery on the rooftop yes and you told me you told me chris you were like i just finished listening to a show about it on this new show i've been listening to the prosecutors you should go check it out and I went and listened to that, fell in love with that show. And then you and I just sort of like built a bit of a new obsession where we talk about cases and, and things. But you came to me about a podcast idea you had about doing things that were like dark and weird and that stuck in your brain. Yeah. Yeah. Just this idea of these, yeah, little like mysteries or like pieces of fiction that just, you know, I, I always think back to this. Stephen King short story, The Man in the Black Suit. Yes. And just like the way it made me feel and just the the environment that King created and just different movies, all these little things that kind of like were interesting highlights that revealed a a darkness, a a mystery to life, and just something very intriguing and good storytelling. Yeah. And I was blown away by the idea and we as we do we brain we will sometimes have a brainstorm session and we'll just go back to life yep uh and that's just we've known each other how long chris uh 25 ish years (laughs) since ninth grade that's what i remember dating ourselves here uh, just a tad maybe let's just say since the 90s oh god chris we're getting close (laughs) to 30 if we're talking about ninth grade that's nearly 30 years for us (laughs) nine yeah like 29 years and yet it only feels like a quarter of that it's like we just met (laughs) but you know we've brainstormed about everything from novels together to Mm. you know different stories and then we did our own podcast with our buddy Corey bishop we did that for three years we did a podcast we are not new to this and i always joke it was early days i always say that there's a line of demarcation for podcasting and that is serial Serial is a definitive line of demarcation of not only doing, but listening to podcasts before they really started to become more and more popularized. And now like Spotify, right, is like fully in the game and it's become its own, I think, much more legitimate. I hate to use those words, but like its own legitimate medium in terms of how people take in entertainment and information and news and all that. It's cool. And it it, it is... uh... You know, back in our day to sort of, (laughs) you know, talk about when we were doing this, if you wanted to listen to a podcast, you largely had to get on to Apple 
uh, Apple Podcasts. Yeah. That was still, and it still much. is kind of so. So the accessibility level was kind of low. A lot of people didn't know how to get to podcasts if they didn't have an Apple device. Uh, it was like a wild frontier when we were doing it. Yeah. And so, you know, Chris started doing his podcast. Uh, tell us about that real quick. Yeah. So I, I do co host a podcast with uh, a friend, Ben, and it's called 80s High. And it's a bit of a nostalgic cast. We look back at different things from the 80s. It can be. Really, anything's up for grabs. It could be movies, TV, books, games, toys, the whole kind of gamut. And we just revisit the property and learn about where it came from, why we liked it, why it was, you know, a part of our culture, what it led to, you know, what kind of came from it, whether it's a sequel or a spinoff or something like that, or it inspired a different kind of work. And then ultimately, we just look at it and say, does it still hold up today? You know, here we are in the 2020s. Does this thing still make sense? You know, we really just see, like, does it stand the test of time? Is it still a good property or is it kind of dated and best left in our memories in the nostalgic haze of yesterday? And so it, it, it's definitely, whereas this is about darkness time, that is definitely more about kind of the, the fun light time. But it's 80s high. It's out there if anyone's interested. Uh, yeah, we'd love it for you to check it out. Please check it out. You know, I'm not I'm not just pumping it because I'm your friend. I'm pumping it because it truly I is. I pay you. Fantastic. Oh. <laughs> yes, you do pay me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it really lit the fire under me because I'd been going like, oh, yeah, it'd be fun to get back into it. I wanted to do true crime, but then I realized there's so much more that I want to talk about and also feeling a bit like the true crime community is quite full and you know i can i add anything new to true crime or can i be sort of a serve as more of a repository of dark knowledge you know and that's really whether it's true crime whether it's the occult whether it is anything weird anything interesting i want to talk about it here so that's where It kind of dovetailed back into, well, let's not just focus just on true crime. Let's do a little bit of everything. I feel like it gives you more creative license to go in different directions, right? You get the ability to kind of explore. Really, it's open up to anything and up to that interpretation, whereas true crime is a pretty narrow lane and it has a lot of specificity. And once you're securely in it, you can't really stray from it. Like if you're doing a true crime podcast and all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to do this fun story about you know, this conspiracy theory about this, people are going to be like, no, 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 bring it back to what the central theme of this is. And so having this broad topic is a, it's a fun playground to explore. I I agree. And I hope it works out. I've, I've spent a good number of months putting together a general vision of how I see this going down. So as we start, we are doing, well, first of all, I should say, I say we, Chris is, a going to be a big part of this show but he's not like my standalone co-host chris has his own podcast chris has his own life uh chris <laughs> is my biggest uh go-to guy and my best friend in the whole world but i need to let him have his life <laughs> so and i as i thought about having other co-hosts um that could be more permanent and whatnot too i realized the same thing these people have their own lives these people live in, Honestly, they live uh, all the way across the country for me, a lot of them. Uh, And so I decided, well, I have a lot of friends and I have a lot of people who are badasses and good at what they do and they have interesting viewpoints. So Chris will be here a good bit, but then I'm going to have a lot of revolving recurring co-hosts coming on with me. We could do a streak of episodes together, maybe some one-offs. It's going to depend largely on what I'm talking about. And there might even be some episodes, too, where I'm solo. We'll see how it goes. I'm excited, but it's time to really set the tone for what I want this show to be. And uh, we decided that the most appropriate topic to do that with out of the whole list of things we have put together is about the Devil's Interval. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Now... If you're a musician, if you are, I don't know, into metal, to jazz, to a lot of different things, or if you just took a lot of music classes in school, you might know what this is. Other terms you might know for it are the tritone is the most important one, the diminished fifth, 
In the augmented or fourth. Augmented fourth, yeah, that's what it was. Okay, yeah. So And we're gonna pretend like we know what those things mean. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, spoiler alert, uh, Chris and I, as a preamble to this, I took a lot of band in high school, but I never took, I, I played the flute for a number of years and I dabble on the guitar, but I've never had a lot of formal music training apart from band class, never had any theory, never had a lot. Chris, what do you got? Yeah, similar for me. I took band in grade school and middle school, kind of stopped there. I've played different instruments, uh, piano, taken some lessons. I've done some guitar, some ukulele. I can barely read music, let's be clear. So, yeah, you know, Allison did not have me on for my music composition and theory knowledge. That much is for sure. Uh, but I have a little bit. So, you know, as I learned about some of this, I could kind of grasp a few of it. But when you get deep into the theory, you know, my eyes just sort of glazed over. And <laughs> I was like, I, I understand, you know, what you're talking about. I'm not going to get it on this listen through the next one and maybe even the fourth but yeah right i've spent a lot of time in recent probably in the last year and a half as i got back into guitar i would watch a lot of youtube videos and i watched a lot of rick beato who is one of my favorite uh youtubers and fantastic musician and talks about a lot of theory and things too in a really accessible way but even as I've tried to crack the code on this, I am still very much a layman. But we're not really here to talk about musical theory. Like, what is what would this have to do with this show if it weren't for the cultural implications? And that's really what I want to get into, because we're going to sprinkle in some musical theory just so we have some foundation. But there's so much more involved in how a musical tone, a whole cultural movement, has been built around it or countercultural as we will get to. Uh, but I didn't even know this existed through all of my musical stuff until Chris brought it up on an episode of eighties high. One of their, yeah. it was like their second episode. Episode two. Yeah. Yeah. Episode two on unsolved mysteries. Yeah. And everybody who's ever watched Unsolved Mysteries, either as a kid or you went, you know, or you heard about it later and started watching on YouTube or you're watching the Netflix reboot, the thing that always stands out regardless is, I think, the music of that yes. show. And so you broke that down beautifully. And that's where we come to the devil's interval. And Chris, I'll, I'll let you tell us about how you came upon that. Absolutely. You know, it's one of those things that Unsolved Mysteries always kind of was stuck in my head as this great piece of nostalgia from the 80s and 90s and so on. And as I was researching it more, the one thing that everyone came back to that they remember is that theme song. It burrows into your brain. It just has this driving kind of relentless theme and all these different pieces that make it so terrifying. And as I was talking about the show itself, I was like, well, I got to do a deep dive into this song and was really looking at the creators, Gary Malkin and Michael Boyd, who kind of co-wrote it. And it's interesting, the co-creators of the show said that they would get letters from parents all the time saying, please change the theme music. Our children are terrified. They can't go to sleep. So talk about banning music. Uh, this right. is kind of funny <laughs> um, because the Unsolved Mysteries theme song did it. And the interesting thing beyond that is that it really kind of drove the co-creators of the song. It kind of drove them a little, I won't say mad, but it did drive them to having a lot of terrible nightmares, living with that music for weeks as they put it together. And there's just different basic elements of the song that makes it so terrifying when you look at just its components. There's the ostinato, which is that repeating rhythmic figure. It gives yep. the song this kind of urgent, inescapable menace. It's driving, it's, you know, rep it's repetitive. It just kind of keeps you going forward. There's that bass line that's really creepy. There's the synthesizer that comes in. It's this sweeping, sliding pitch bends. It's like this wailing siren part. That, that part always gives me the chills of the... <laughs> yes, that's the part that always made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And I didn't want to be in a dark room as a kid watching it, but I always was uh, yes. terrified. <laughs> regardless. Yes. And then there's like a drum sound that's almost like a gunshot or an explosion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the other piece of it is the tritone or this devil's interval, as it's been kind of referred to. It's this dissonant combination of tones that also create a sense of tension, ambiguity, and instability. 
and we'll talk about this, but it's mostly because it just feels off or unsettling. Right. Uh, it just it doesn't quite have that right hit. And the last thing that was kind of, I think, important about this song is, like I said, after all those weeks completing the score and putting everything together, Malkin said he had to go on a camping trip because he was plagued by the song. It destroyed him for weeks and he had all these terrible nightmares. So it really burrowed into his brain and stuck there in a bad way. That really affected me when I listened to that part of the podcast, because I mean, other than watching Robert Stack and his iconic trench coat walk out, uh, the song is really the the thing. Uh, you know, you have the silhouette, you have the sound. I mean, that was the magic of that show. It just really figured out how to merge those things. Yeah. And so hearing that it affected the composers in very much the same way just really validated, I think, probably so many people who knew they were freaked out by the song and didn't know why. And that's why it's so great to talk about musical theory, even in a very limited way, is that if you listen to a piece of music and it gives you a certain feeling, there are reasons behind that, that uh, people that existed thousands of years before us figured out and used, and they even figured out the math of it right. and and how it works in concert with the human ear to tell us why. So when we talk about the devil's interval or the tritone, first of all, it is, it has a cultural thing. And that's, like I said, the thing we're going to come back to with this, but largely the culture believes, and because this has been passed down for many, many years, that this series of tones has been banned by the Catholic church because they saw it as evil and possibly summoning the devil. Mm -hmm. So think about how taboo that feels, like how when you hear about the Devil's Interval and you go and do a very cursory Twitter, Google, TikTok search, the first thing you hear is that this is a series of sounds that have been banned by the church and it's bad, 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 bad. Like we've always heard about a myth or otherwise some folklore about a sound, a particular sound that either drives someone crazy or... Or makes them shit their pants. <laughs> we gotta or there's even up. there's even frequencies of music that shatter glass, right? There's notes that can shatter glass if they hit that right frequency. And so it kind of, you know, at a surface level, you're like, well, sure, that makes sense. Of course, they might ban this. It sounds like something, especially in the Middle Ages, that the Catholic Church would do. They wouldn't understand it. They're um, they're not as smart as we were. And so... Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that thing, like, they were so much more superstitious and yeah. religious. And we here in the 21st century are so aware and woke yeah. well and we're we're advanced technologically and scientifically so we just yes. know so much more now that they didn't understand because it was <laughs> it's referred to as the dark ages <laughs> exactly and that you know to use the corporate parlance we are going to circle back to that <laughs> uh, <laughs> put a pin in it put a yes, pin yes, in yes. it we're going to circle back <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, if we want to talk about dark topics, we could get into corporate culture on a, ooh, on a future episode. Oh. Ooh, oof, oof. Uh, uh, I've, got, I've got things to say. <laughs> oh, God. Chris will be. Yeah. Uh, we will be pulling Chris <laughs> out of the stable of uh, revolving co hosts for that episode. <laughs> um, so I guess let's bring it on back a little bit just to say people who are listening to this still. They have heard it's a tone, it's a sound, it's something that the church banned, it drives people mad. Yeah, 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 the devil's interval. Okay, but what actually is it? So I, again, music theory people, experts, please take into account that we are not experts and we have owned that much. So I'm going to ex try to explain this like everybody in the audience is three and I myself am six. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so I I had to first learn what an interval is when you talk about the devil's interval. And all it is, is the distance between two points on a musical scale uh, or instrument. So from A to B, from B to C, or from B to G, okay, that is an interval. Now, a musical scale, if we have to go that far back, a musical scale is a series of notes. The interval is the space between those notes. 
Okay, good enough. It makes sense. No, it makes. I and it's funny when I do this, and maybe it's helpful to other people. I always envision a piano and the series of keys. Like when I think about intervals or chords or just music notes and different parts of the scale, you know, I always picture a piano, and that helps me visualize what this looks like. Because if you're if you're a visual learner or that just makes sense to you, that to me is always a good focal point. Yeah. My instrument that I go to first is the guitar. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because it is the most like tangible. It's amazing that it isn't the flute, although in the flute I can still play certain musical scales with sure. just by muscle memory alone. But the guitar I think is more recent for me. So that's probably where my why my brain's going there. Definitely. But it is uh yeah, it's hard to describe uh beyond that if you haven't played any music at all. So we're just gonna talk about when music sounds good and it feels right in your ear versus when it feels a little off. We'll just go with that. Okay. So everybody maybe has some sense of what's going on here. So usually when the right two notes are played together, it has a pleasing harmony, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a chord. And that's because, well, honestly, it actually comes down again to math. So each note is played in a different frequency. So whenever you have a ratio of frequencies that goes well together in your ear, that's why it sounds correct. Yeah. Right? So if that ratio of frequencies of the notes being played together feels off, it's because it doesn't make a neat fraction, okay? This is where math comes to tell us like, hey, you know, I'm in everything. I always think of long division when I, before you learn to do go past the decimal point where you had remainders, you're like, the answer is three with a remainder of two, right? And (laughs) that's what it reminds me of. If it's not a neat fraction, you have that remainder hanging on there that you haven't quite worked out. Exactly. Exactly. So we're talking about notes that sound good together. They have a consonance. That's where they they mesh. They come together. And then the opposite of that is dissonance. Mm -hmm. That's where they are thrown apart uh, because they don't work together. Well, That's where the devil's interval comes in. So when you're playing along a musical scale and you're playing pretty notes that sound good together, you're going to hit a point around the fourth or fifth of that scale where those notes clash for some reason. Like everything works in this perfect scale except for this part, which is almost like every rule of nature that we understand, whether it comes down to weather or language or anything. It's like it's this rule except when it's not. I before E except after C. Oh, no, that is not true. You think about so many things like that where the common wisdom doesn't hold up. And that's where the tritones come in. It lives in this space of dissonance between like the perfect fourth and the perfect fifth on the musical scale. So I have a question. If I'm a listener right now and I'm still a little bit confused, are there any modern examples that might help people like... Whatever, whatever the term for visualize is for hearing, <laughs> Audi- audioize, whatever the word is, right? I feel like there's a word yeah. there. But for someone to sort of imagine what this sounds like, are there any like common examples of this devil's interval kind of sound? My go-to is the opening chords of The Simpsons. The that they sing, right? Yep. The Simpsons. I, I'm yeah. not a singer, but it is that sort of off key off kilter yeah ascending tritone that's where the notes are going up in the scale Mm -hmm. and you might not think about it right off the bat but there's something fun and not quite normal about this is what i hear in my head well and i think it's a theme song that everyone knows sounds a little off but maybe like we know it at some level but maybe never put conscious thought to it or yeah. words or this kind of explanation to and so that's why i think it's really helpful to have this example in your mind because it's funny when we talked about unsolved mysteries in the theme song you said well what part is the tritone and i'm here to tell you i still can't tell you what it is i know it's in there i believe it's in there but if i piece that music or that song apart, I can't quite tell you exactly what it is, unless it's that piano repetition where they're being played in tritone. So it's one of those, like if you imagine a chord of three keys on a piano, maybe one of them is out of harmony or is in dissonance, or I think diaphony was another term. Yes. Um, that that makes it sound just a little not correct and therefore adds to the 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 unsettling. I don't want to say creepy. It is kind of creepy, but you know, the unsettling nature of it. 
Um, yeah. Another one that is interesting to me, speaking of cartoons, is the South Park guitar riff. The you know before like the song comes in. Again, if you are familiar with that theme song, you probably never put words to it or thought to it, but it it is an off guitar riff. It doesn't sound quite right. And so that's another one in my mind that's like, oh, okay, that's a tritone. Get it. Right. And I could throw a few others out there offhand. Uh, Even Flow by Pearl Jam. The first mm. uh, two notes that Eddie Vedder sings is a wicked tritone. Personally, I've always found his singing to be kind of unsettling. There's like a, yeah. uh, it, it vibrates with this kind of wickedness, you know? And, and uh, one of the first songs I ever heard by Pearl Jam was Even Flow. It was, you know, such a huge song. So not knowing why exactly I felt the way that it made me feel, but then finding out like, okay, it's these series of tones that just evoke a feeling like when there's this slight bit of dissonance in your head it just makes you perk up it might not always be nails on the chalkboard in fact most of these examples are not really nails on a chalkboard they sound good together in their own way but it's just not the expected way dissonance exists only from i think our main perspective like what we expect but you can make it work in something so much jazz music, so much like early, like heavy metal and also, you know, musicals like uh, West Side Story, Maria, the ascendance of his voice as he sings about this woman that he's in love with that he knows deep, deep down that he's risking everything to fall in love with because she's in a rival gang, you know? Right. So there's like hopefulness and, and, and a little anxiety built into it too. And it uses tritones to create that feeling. Yeah. Back in the early centuries BC, I mean, we're talking about composers from way, way back, like 335 BC. Uh, there have been composers talking about tritones and how unpleasant they are and how to avoid them in order to not sound out of tune. You think about the early days, like people making music. And they're like, these notes don't sound good together. Why? You know, and they're trying to figure all this out. Is everyone from the early days Minnesotan? Yeah. <laughs> these these notes don't sound good together. Why? Why not? <laughs> you know? I mean, you betcha they sound pretty bad, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I love that. I love that accent. That's how, that's, that's the truth of my brain now. That's how they oh, talk. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, we've established it here. Oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> but uh, several centuries after that, Cleonidas, uh, one of an, uh, like an early scholar on this, he coined the term diaphony mm -hmm. uh, to refer to two notes that don't work together, essentially. Uh, so throughout thousands of years from texts from Greek to Arabic that study music, they talk about tritones and dissonance so this concept has been around since honestly the birth of you know music mm -hmm. as a whole uh this is not an old or i'm sorry this is not a new or modern thing uh important to establish that <laughs> this is you know this is jesus times if you're believing that stuff so you got to go back a long way uh and you'll find that but composition and in music, found a place in the spiritual setting. Uh, the biggest uh, commissioners of music, the biggest users of music throughout, you know, modern human civilization as it moved throughout the centuries, they end up in these ornate churches in say the ninth century so we're now in the in the 800s and you know they're starting to sing more and more reverently in their big cathedrals and and whatnot and and uh so we have monks uh that are chanting and uh who had the gregorian chant album in the 90s raise the roof <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> um you know it, it they started somewhere uh nothing is new under the sun it's as true. we will will find right we took we took gregorian chants from the ninth century and set it to a lo-fi techno beat from the ninth century to the 1990s and we like covered ourselves in dracar noir or had a yeah. boyfriend who did <laughs> I had on my guest jeans, my Reebok pumps, baby, and my hypercolor t-shirt. Oh my god! Listening to Gregorian chants. What was that? 
There was a disc that you would get at like Natural Wonders at the mall. Yes. There was like that disc. Of, what was that called? Or like it was on uh, television commercials like, call now for only nineteen ninety nine. Oh my gosh. It was like, oh, I remember this. Oh, we'll have to. Oh, if anybody's listening, uh, you know. Hold on. I got a fact is... check. I got a fact check right now because I remember <laughs> those. You could get like a CD. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know this very well. What would you In call fact, that? Like new age music? Yeah, New Age. And I think Enya was on it, too. Oh, totally. If I'm not mistaken. I'm sure Sail Away I... was on there. Pure Moods! Pure Moods! Oh, Pure Moods! <laughs> oh, my when, goodness. When did that come out? Because oh. if it's any if it's in 1989, that means you have to cover it on your show. <laughs> it feels very mid-90s, but let me just see. Pure Moods. I think you're right. Yeah, because I... it had, like, Return to Innocence. That's the song I remember. A return yep. to innocence. Original release, 1994. Okay. Re-release, okay. 1997. It is pure 90s. Oh. They, I hope it's on a music streaming service. I'm actually going to go look later because <laughs> I think that would be such a, a great way to relive oh my God. Uh, Absolutely. the wackiness. That was, the 90s was so interested in trying to find a cultural foothold in something because I remember... Yes, they did the Gregorian chants, but they also did like swing and ska. Yeah, ska. That? Oh, yeah. Squirrel Nut they Zippers. Tra- yeah, Brian yeah, yeah. Setzer. Zoot Suit Zoot Daddy. Suit Riot. <laughs> or Zoot Suit. Oh, um, were they called <laughs> Cherry Riot. Were they called Cherry Poppin' Daddies? Is that what they were Cherry called? Cherry Poppin' Daddies. Okay, so Zoot I wasn't Suit totally Riot. wrong in my daddy. Throw back uh, a bottle of it. <laughs> But, yeah, the mid nineties we had to go back to the thirties or we were trying to go back to so many things to find something and, <laughs> and we found it, it in the ninth stuck. century. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like back in the ninth century, monks were trying to derive all kinds of harmonies, right? And so but they kept running into these dastardly tritones. Uh, so they would go interval by interval trying to work this out and then find the tritone. And the problem was, is that they're really hard to sing, uh, and they're hard to harmonize too. Uh, and whenever you see harmonizing tritones, it sounds off. It sounds not bad, but it might make you kind of... Well, it kind of goes back to the Simpsons, right? The singing of the Simpsons yeah. intro, like the way they say the Simpsons, it's like... We know it, but it, again, it just sounds a little odd. You're like, is that really what they meant to do? Now right, imagine singing right. an entire song like that. Like that's two words, The Simpsons, right? Imagine trying yeah. to sing an entire song. That's hard to do. And honestly, uh, Danny Elfman was the composer of The Simpsons. And if you listen to any number of his soundtracks, like, you know, Pee Wee's Big Adventure or, you know, Beetlejuice or, you know, any of these, especially a lot of the things that he did with Tim Burton, like early well, sure, on. Sure, yeah. His uh his soundtracks are all about that off weirdness. Honestly, I think Danny Elfman might be your best composer modern to check out for existence of the tritone. And so the monks hated trying to work around these harmonies so much, like the harmonizing problems with the tritone, that they invented a whole other music scale that eliminated the tritones altogether it's called the daisy and scale and i am not going to break it down beyond that because that's for you music nerds out there but it is again they just found a harmonic workaround by changing some octaves and things up you know like the way they step things together to make a harmony tritones appear regularly throughout composed pieces of music uh, from those early periods to create certain moods and feelings. So uh, if you wanted to build tension uh, in a piece that's then like you're building tension with the tritone and then you're resolving it with a perfect tone. It like, it's an uplifting thing or, and then it can be thrilling at mm-hmm. the same time. Right. And I love this in 1555, uh, Italian composer Nicola Vincentino described uh, tritones as vivacious and forceful when they're ascending, when they're going up. Uh, so that's the Simpsons theme. Again, Maria West Side Story. Uh, WandaVision is a very recent example. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, in, in, the introductory tone to that show is uh, very much in the ascending tritone, like happy, fun, kind of quirky right. uh, mode. Right, right. 
and then and then he also said that the tritone was sad and funereal when it's descending so it's kind of interesting the mood completely i guess it's like when you're petting a a a cat with with the run of its fur versus when you pet it backwards against the grain is a big old mess oh, <laughs> not yeah, as pleasing would... <laughs> no and you will probably get clawed i was to gonna death. say especially uh... to the cat the cat is not a fan of that that's for sure <laughs> um so uh eventually though we get to 12th century france so we have the 9th century monks making their beautiful songs to god and then we go a few hundred years and we get to france uh the feast of fools is was a big celebration that they had after i think it was the consecration of uh the notre dame uh, cathedral they would have all these these festivals where people are just going crazy uh getting drunk and completely wasted and doing very lewd acts is it like their mardi gras is that what i'm to understand very much i i mean honestly i feel like our mardi gras is probably a watered down version of whatever this is uh I spring break at say, panama beach i <laughs> yes i'm uh i wanted to go back and say i'm getting uh, a good bit of this info about this and just everything that helped me even try to describe what a tritone is mm. i learned from adam neely on youtube in e-e-l-y mm. and he breaks down tritones and the cultural aspects of it very beautifully watch so, this video it's 30 minutes but it's worth every minute it's so good yeah just if you search adam neely in e-e-l-y and tritones you'll come to it uh it's like the top result and it, yeah it's fantastic uh so anyway uh in the 12th century france the feast of fools happened oh and he talked about people eating sausage on an altar which sounds like a pretty good time to me but I mean, again you know, i am not i wouldn't have made it we've all been there we've all eaten sausage on an altar you just gotta you know cop to it it's okay anytime pre-20th century i would have died because a you know i had to have my kids delivered by a c-section mm -hmm. uh for medical reasons mm -hmm. so uh, would have died there. Yep. Um, or I probably would have been burned at the stake. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think there are many opportunities for me as a person to have lived <laughs> beyond like the age of 18. Right. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so yay. Hooray. Uh, modern day. Uh, but anyway, uh, sausage on the Vatican altar. That should be a thing. Anyway. So uh, people were getting crazy and the Vatican was not happy. So he commissioned some new Christmas music to help people get right with God. I mean, that, that could be the name of a book. The Vatican was not happy. I just feel like, you know, there's a lot of <laughs> finger wagging and uh, you can't do this and can't do that. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that what the composers delivered at that time were some very beautiful uh, pieces of music again you can hear them on this adam neely video but the songs are full of tritones are these the madrigals yes okay. yes i think so okay yeah so the songs are full of tritones and remember the monks didn't like these things because they were hard to sing so in in, in many ways i feel like that that people took something that was hard to work with and made something so beautiful is i think the perfect thing if you're doing music for spiritual or whatever you would think like i'm gonna make music that like makes the impossible possible it's like inspirational people dug it though like when this music was was heard people liked it like it it, it evoked new feelings in them that music prior hadn't quite done before and so this whole movement was born from it the ars nova uh, the new art in in French, as opposed to the Ars Antiqua, which was the the old the old times, the before times, the oldies. It's the oldies station. We're like, no, no, no. It's the oldies of the twelfth century. That's so, right. Versus the uh, the chart toppers of this Ars Nova. Ars Nova kids with their mixolydian scales and their fancy modes. Uh, right. How dare they playing their harpsichords? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and so. It's interesting because I think in our own lives, we can probably think of the birth of a musical movement. I mean, us Gen Xers, maybe the first time you heard Nirvana playing Smells Like Teen Spirit. Or grunge, first... baby, grunge. Right. There was nothing like it for us at the time. Or if we heard um, Thriller by Michael Jackson or 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 maybe Billie Jean, like back right. in the 80s, you're hearing this 
new thing yeah. uh, that hadn't really been done yet or the first time you heard i don't know like i'm I'm thinking like nwa right the first time you heard like gangsta rap or even like going back a little bit further like the beatles and elvis presley like yes. their style of music at the time was just something mind-bending and new and was just not a thing that happened before tell you what it all did too it made a lot of people nervous it made a lot of people feeling like People are getting too spicy and they need to calm the hell down. There were some great old timey words for talking about things being inappropriate that Adam actually talks about in his video, which was pernicious, licentious, lasciviousness. It was like <laughs> these old timey words for inappropriate. Oh. And that's when the Ars Nova was born mm. and the church became suspicious of these new artists, it was, they were using these words, Martin Luther as well. I mean, you're, you're going right up into the Renaissance era with these people, not liking these spicy tunes that incite uh, lasciviousness in people. You're getting too sexy. You're throwing it back as yes. it were. It, so you're, we're talking about kids these days uh, in 14th century style. And, and, What's interesting, none of it seems like it would do that, but I think we've been so used to hearing these sounds throughout our lives yeah. that I'd, I'd say we're a little more ingrained with it, but like imagine the first pop culture mass produced use of tritones, like hardcore, like going full, going ham on mm -hmm. the tritones <laughs> and like this church song, you know what I mean? Like... You're writing letters that take months to get to where you're sending them to talk about this song you heard in church. And that you were inflamed to a fleshy lust through the sweetness of zither playing. That was one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> inflamed yes. to a fleshy lust. Uh, that That is... Yeah, I love it, it, I love old timey like uh, ways of speaking and writing. So good. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, it's it is its own art form these days. <laughs> oh, also, those kids in their zither plane. <laughs> it's crazy, right? I mean, yeah, uh, these crazy zither kids. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so obviously we have an inflamed uh, Vatican. Uh, we have these licentiously lascivious sex demons eating sausage on altars so you would think oh yeah this is the cultural breeding ground of the church banning the tritone mm -hmm. but this this has carried down for hundreds of years to now musicians metal musicians now that are still alive that are still making music are saying that the tritone because of its spiciness, because of its lasciviousness, because it could summon the devil, mm -hmm. was banned from use. But it wasn't. Uh, are you uh, are you harsh on my mellow? I I am come on, man. Your mellow. What? It was never lies. Banned. Lies. I came into this topic researching a musical tone that can make you go crazy. Wait, I'm sorry. Is, is, this, is this podcast called Ding Dong Bummer Times, man? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I mean, seriously, though, uh, I came into this really thinking that I was going to learn about all these incidents of people playing this series of notes and bad things happening. I, I honestly was, like, prepared for conspiracy theories and rabbit holes yeah or the belief that back then they actually thought you would summon the devil they would open a hell mouth into the darkest regions of the underworld like there's an allure to that belief that oh yeah of course they felt that way of course the catholic church has banned lots of things throughout history right. of course they would ban this but okay actually not true and so i know a lot of you who might or be listening to this right now or waiting for us to say the other term that you know the devil's interval under and it is probably the most famous one other you know tritone is what a music nerd uses right but if you're going to talk about the devil's interval you have to mention the term diabolus in musica mm -hmm. Whoa, uh, uh, the devil's uh, in the music uh, that's what i just heard yep yep that's what you just heard you are a latin scholar are you not uh, uh 
Yeah, no, that's not okay. Latin. <laughs> so, like, apparently, this term is used to refer to the tritone. It has been the AKA of the situation for centuries. But the weird thing is, Diabolus in Musica didn't even make its first appearance until 1725. Does that sound like the ninth century to you? Uh, hold on. Um, 2022 minus 7th century. Carry the one. Yeah, that sounds about right. Are you still doing math? Oh my god. <sighs> okay. You were talking about so, math earlier. I think we can agree that this is a long time after the Middle Ages. Just a bit. Uh, just a bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. Um, And the main reason that this came about is due to a term. This is going to be, again, in Latin or Italian, mi contra fa es diabolus in musica, which is me after fa or me with fa. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, the musical scale, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. So me and fa is the devil in music, me against fa. So if you play those two notes at the same time, on the keyboard, it does create a not great sound, but it's not a tritone. Yeah. Okay? It's not, because they're right next to each other. You have to be three spaces apart in order for it to be a tritone, hence the tri, uh, T-R-I, and tritone. So anyway, there is apparently lots of musical theory to sort through that I'm not going to, but according to the chord systems widely used at the time, me contra fa resulted in a tritone. So... You could, if you bent the rules a little bit, make me contra fa a tritone. That is where I, th- where they think that they were referring to. What they meant, though, was that it was a devil to sing. They're just, it's their way of saying, like, man, singing this is a pain in the ass. Remember, Gregorian monks decided to completely invent their own <laughs> freaking, was it scale? Their own music scale, yeah. right? Their own yeah. scale to get rid of these hard to sing tritones. Yep. And so singers would improvise during performances in order to avoid having to sing it. And that was like Musica Ficta, I think is what was called in the uh, Adam Neely video. Uh, But either way, this is where Diabolus and Musica came about. It was a an idiom. It was a figure of speech. It was nothing to do with Satan. Okay. But, but... The wording is controversial and evocative, right? Sure. Even for people of that time period, like if we heard the devil in music, like in our ears, in our language, we would think that that was, we could think that that was talking about the devil. The rest of us would be thinking like, oh, they're referring to a pain in the ass. Or yeah, it's it's evocative. It's not literal. It's an evocative term to make it sound like dark music, but not literally thinking there's the devil or some sinister thing behind the music yeah exactly and and so it goes to show that this sensibility kind of happens back then as well so first of all let's quickly i want to use adam neely's uh the way he disseminated diabolus and musica uh linguistically was really great so in greek dia means through and bolos Uh, means to throw or to separate so it means two notes that are thrown apart that's and also they think that the diabolos uh, could be referring to diaphony like it could be a a bridge off of that uh which is the early word for dissonance um by the way so none of the early texts though from thousands of years ago when all that was going on show any mention of the devil satan or any derivative thereof when speaking of the tritone. It has never been ever associated with the devil until, until 1725, after they had the Diabolus and Musica, we start having artists in the 18th and 19th centuries looking back at this and playing into it. They're like leaning into it. Oh, the devil in music? Well, let's make something that's kind of devilish sounding that's kind of yeah evil that has like a, a a trickster vibe to it and so we look at the piece dance macabre by camille sanchons uh in 1872 leans heavily into tritones that then link back to images of death and devilishness i mean the term dance macabre is very you know 
much part of that, right? Yeah. Uh, Very so sinister. that's yeah, exactly. And you start to see other composers doing the same thing of that time, leaning into that devilishness, leaning into that evil. I I bring up a. Gustav Holst in 1914 wrote that this whole symphony called The Planets and the first movement is called Mars the Bringer of War. And it's, again, it sounds like something almost like the Superman theme. You could see that how John Williams might have been inspired by this uh, when he was coming up. It has a very epic, very sweeping, very warlike battle music uh, that leans very heavily on the tritone so they were doing it pretty far back the the devil and musica uh so you could just see how artists played into that in much the same way we see a lot of punk and you know rap and a lot of these sort of counterculture musical movements of our lifetimes so we go from gustav holst in 1914 with mars bringer of war the planets highly recommend you cue that one up you'll probably recognize it right off the bat like you've heard it before you just don't know where it's one of those uh and the same with dance macabre beautiful and same thing you know we go throughout the 20th century where so much jazz and the blues is being influenced and and using these tritones to create just like again that feeling of like rebellion that feeling of like free form we're doing our thing we're creating this whole movement and then you get to black sabbath and black sabbath is in many cases considered the godfather right the the one that gave birth to modern day heavy metal music with the song black sabbath on the album black Black sabbath Sabbath. (laughs) and uh the beautiful or fascinating thing about that is they talk about how they were inspired by Mars bring of war to create the bass tones and like the main tones of their song black Sabbath. And if you listen to the two songs together, you can absolutely see the parallels. They sound very similar, but the black Sabbath, it just makes it even more dissonant. And they really brought with that image of the, the occult images of the devil images of evil quote unquote and that is where i think the marriage between the devil and the tritones like the literal devil Mm. that's when it happened it didn't happen by the catholic church in the medieval times not the restaurant in the actual medieval (laughs) times (laughs) it didn't happen then It happened when we made it happen in the 1970s, essentially. Isn't this around the time of Satanic Panic? Wasn't that in the 70s when that started picking up? Yeah, yeah, like late 70s into the early 80s. 80s. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely building steam uh, around that period because, you know, after Black Sabbath, you get bands like Slayer, Metallica, all of whom have gone on to repeat the lie, not that they're lying themselves, but they've all been lied to, that the Tritone was banned by the Catholic Church. I mean, even Slayer's album is Diabolus in Musica. <laughs> like, that's one of their most famous albums. And they all took it from the, the mistranslation of Diabolus in Musica. They all built this fake belief and so what are we gonna do as this countercultural movement we're going to make music in honor of that we're gonna like push that we're gonna be like evil and we're gonna be dark and we're gonna be scary and and all these things and it was all based on a game of telephone went horribly wrong over the course of many centuries but especially the last i would say two to three centuries because the artists that i mentioned you know in the 18th and 19th centuries that were leaning into that devil imagery they knew it was a joke they knew they were playing into it they were mocking it in their own way that was their way of being subversive but then we changed that in order to create another form of subversiveness where we're almost mocking this period of like where we thought they were less refined and we're using that to then it's almost like a straw man like a historical straw man we got to build up this thing that didn't really exist so we can knock it down right 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 and it's not true yeah (laughs) yeah it 
blows me away. So that's the research that I found when I dug into this that really had me going, wait, we are so wrong and we keep parroting the wrong stuff. Why do we do this? Well, you know, it is interesting, right? Because a few things I feel like going on here are, you know, memes as a unit of culture have an an ability to self-replicate through passing along. And Adam in his video makes a great distinction about repetition being a legitimizing thing, that the more you repeat something, uh, particularly if it's not true, uh, it legitimizes it. Saying it multiple times legitimizes what you're saying. Repetition legitimizes. And he kind of goes through it as a joke and keeps repeating it to a very, I think, profound effect because it's true. And as we start to look around and question claims that are out there in our world and if they're real or not. And a lot of it is like at surface or face value, you might think, oh, you know what? That makes sense. Again, well, the, the Catholic Church bans a lot of things, has banned a lot of things. Certain sects of our culture ban things because it is lascivious or licentious or right. wrong. And so the sniff test seems right. Like, yeah, of course, things get banned. So naturally this would happen. And we also know that like, I mean, we keep talking about the 90s, but remember when Marilyn Manson was like the worst thing to some people oh. ever? This yeah. talk about somebody who's invoking the devil and this dark imagery and is ruining children and and probably using a lot of fucking tritones. Right. It's just like how he was creating this darkness, this goth culture that was so wrong. Well, that didn't really materialize into too much, right? And so we always had this scapegoat to blame something on. So I, just, I think there's something to that. But I also, and this is throughout all your episodes, I'll probably come back to this. There's this idea of a simple explanation and a beautiful explanation. And the beautiful yes. one is more alluring, but it's not usually the correct one. It's not necessarily true, but we want it to be true because there is something mysterious and beautiful and enticing about it. And I feel like there's some of that at play here and why this just keeps getting repeated. I think you're absolutely right. I think it, it all comes back to, you know, the rules of propaganda too. Like when you, like the repetition legitimizes that butts up against the big lie. It's interesting, right? Like we can think about how distributing lies and propaganda, you know, is generally hugely frowned upon. But I do wonder if there hadn't been enough people to believe that lie back in the 70s or when there were these young people sitting down with their guitars to figure out a way to work out their frustration and rage and and all these feelings about, you know, society and they weren't in some way fueled by this belief that part of their art was going against the Catholic grain, yeah. the religious grain. If they didn't know, even falsely, that the tritone was banned, if they always knew, like we know now that that was a myth, right? Would those movements have even been born? I mean, that's like the stuff I sit and ponder sometimes when I think about like time travel and like, what if this didn't happen? Would this have happened? You know, or we talk about like Freakonomics situations. If people hadn't believed that this was banned, would Ozzy fucking Osbourne have had a career? You know, I mean, it's like, <laughs> and if those movements hadn't been born, where would people be today? I mean, there's so many ways you could branch off from that, from careers that never happened to possibly like, the West Memphis Three never have been arrested in the first place for those murders. I mean, those things that happened directly because of the satanic panic. Like, if people didn't have this thing about devil music, I remember my mom reading the lyrics of Metallica's Master of Puppets cassette tape to my brother to convince him that this that Metallica was devil <laughs> music and that he was going to go to hell. And if you played it backwards, it would say worship Satan or whatever. Oh, I forgot about the whole thing of back backtracking music to see what the what the real message was when played in reverse. Oh, my goodness. You just think about like those things that might never have happened if people hadn't believed a lie. We talk about fighting propaganda and fighting misinformation. And yes, we want to do that. But when you think about the things that sprung around those messed up beliefs, it's just like the world would not be recognizable. So I'm, I, I, I guess 
I don't know where I'm going with this, Chris, but when I discovered this and when I discovered what was born around it and the fact that all of us were fooled by it, I was just blown away. Uh, So this, to me, though, like brought such more fruitful discussion and like knowing that we used this false belief to influence so many things that are consequential in so many ways. (laughs) So... So that's where I am, Chris. My mind got blowed up and and thinking that this whole thing was like about like supernatural devil music when in fact we made the devil, we put it in there. Are you feeling disillusioned? Are you feeling relieved, bummed? Like, are you happy it's not this whole history of people thinking that music, this joyous thing of music or this thing that at least drives us to feelings. It's not always joyous, right? Because sometimes music songs are sad, but there's a, a comfort to whatever you want to call it, the universality of that feeling. Yeah, I will tell you this. I wish sometimes the world were as simple as these myths make it look. Okay. If only, if only it were as simple as play these three notes and it opens a door to to Satan's, you know, his little sex dungeon. I imagine he has. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I wish it were that simple, yeah, right? Yeah. But it isn't. And so then, you know, all these other things that like feed into it and make it more complicated, more gray, more like if we hadn't relied on this lie throughout the centuries, we might not have this cultural cornerstone that we have so i will just say this like no i'm not bummed sometimes i wish the world were that simple but i also feel like if it were like we wouldn't have podcasts and we wouldn't have really cool youtubers who tell us things uh or these really smart educated people sharing their knowledge uh that we can maybe help disseminate to hopefully enlighten people like i guess like the quest of enlightenment depends on uh, things being very difficult and complicated or nuanced you know you have to like dig into that and that's what I really want to do here so so that's why I thought this was a good choice of a first topic because I feel like we're gonna do a lot of this on this show I was saying your first season you're hoping to kind of have a theme to it so like what can listeners expect from the first season of this podcast we start off with the devil's interval where do you go from here Well, uh, from here, we're going into sculpture uh, and paintings, and we're going to talk about all the like mostly physical art forms as well as like obviously the musical. You pitched it to me as the dark arts, not Harry Potter. That's what that was your pitch to me. That was your pitch, which I thought was hilarious. (laughs) You're right. I should have stuck with that. That's what it is. Uh, The dark arts. Because, yeah, we want to talk about various art forms and the dark things associated with them. And we'll see what it, where it comes out. Our next episode, I went down some rabbit holes in that one. And I had a lot of fun along the way. And I know it's not always going to be fun. Is the devil back in the next episode? Does the devil make a reappearance? Yes, uh, he does. In the form of a blue anatomically correct creature <laughs> that we want to <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Devil's Interval, Tritone, whatever you want to call it, use them to your heart's content. It was a bad game of telephone. Enjoy your heavy metal music. Still enjoy it. With with a little bit of ease now, because at least you, you can like, unless you really want to summon the devil, I guess you can listen to me like, okay... I know the devil's not going to pop out <laughs> of my iPod uh, earphones uh, and assault my brain. If you were just listening to Slayer in the hopes that would open that door yeah. to hell for you to walk through, it's not enough. It's sort of like thinking you could just mix some flour and sugar together and get a wedding cake. You need a lot more ingredients and more methods to put the whole thing together. Uh, we have total confidence in your abilities to get to hell. Eventually. You might have to go find a original copy of the Necronomicon to summon all of the dark spirits. We will talk about that, in fact, oh, on a sure. future episode. I have no doubts. Yeah, yeah. Um, and cults and the occult and mm-hmm. weird psychological phenomenon and, and, you know, so much weird, dark, cool, fascinating stuff to take you into week after week and and uh chris is going to eventually be roped in to being my full-time lackey (laughs) until then we will have him 
very gratefully uh, as our occasional co-host. And eventually what I really want to do is put all the co-hosts together into a mud wrestling pit and have you guys go at it. You know, do we have to vie? Is it a last one standing <laughs> to vie to be yes. the ultimate uh, like elimination round? The ultimate sidekick. The ultimate ding dong sidekick. <laughs> uh, I am King Ding Dong. <laughs> yes it will be king ding dong uh it's all i ever wanted in life it's all i ever wanted oh (laughs) all right well thank you so much uh and i hope you enjoyed this episode uh we will be back very soon uh with our deep dive into again that blue anatomically correct creature uh but i know right i'm getting thirsty Oh dear. Uh, So if you have any uh, comments, suggestions, or what have you, please, you know, reach out to me on the socials at ddarknesstime at gmail.com or ddarknesstime on Twitter. We'll be getting the website, the Insta, all the other socials up and going very soon. But uh, you're in the first episode, man. We're we're still we have some construction dust. We gotta like clear out onwards and upwards, as I like to say. Exactly, exactly. So we'll see you soon. Ding dong, bye. I don't know. Have a licentious day. <laughs> yes. There we go. Ding dong, bye. <laughs> Ding Dong Darkness Time has been brought to you and produced by yours truly, Allison Dixon. It was made possible by an array of amazing co-hosts, friends, family, but especially you, the listeners. Big shouts also go out to the brilliant Nathaniel Dixon for the show art and future legend Spencer Morlock for all the music. I'll be back again soon with another episode. In the meantime, be good, you little ding-dongs.